ನನ್ನ ಧ್ವಜ ಜನ ಹಂಜನಾಯ ಜಮ್ಮು ನೀರ ಜಮ್ಮು ನೀರ
Lord of Imanandi, Hari Hari Bo. <clears throat> so I chose a verse from the sixth chapter, verse number 30. Chapter is Jnana Yoga. <clears throat> Yom Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Yomam Prashanti Sarvatraha. Sarvachamai Pasyati. Tasyaham Nam Pranasyami. Sajame Na Pranasyati. Yomam Prashanti Sarvatraha. Sarvam Chamai Pasyati Tasyaham Nam Pranasyami Sachamena Pranasyati Chant <laughs> Translation, for one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I'm never lost, nor he is ever lost to me. For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I'm never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. <clears throat> Purport, a person in Krishna consciousness certainly sees Lord Krishna everywhere, and he sees everything in Krishna. Such a person may appear to see all separate manifestations of the material nature, but in each and every instance he is conscious of Krishna, knowing that everything is a manifestation of Krishna's energy. Nothing can exist without Krishna, and Krishna is the Lord of everything. This is the basic principle of Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is the development of love of Krishna, a position transcendental even to material liberation. At this stage of Krishna consciousness, beyond self-realization, the devotee becomes one with Krishna in the sense that Krishna becomes everything for the devotee, and the devotee becomes full in loving Krishna. An intimate relationship between the Lord and the devotee then exists. In that stage, the living entity can never be annihilated, nor is the personality of Godhead ever out of the sight of the devotee. To merge in, in Krishna is spiritual annihilation. A devotee takes no such risk. As stated in Brahma Samhita, Premanjana surcharita bhakti vilochanenam santasa daiva ridayeshu vilokayanti yam shama sundaram chintaguna sarupam govindam adipurusham tamaham bhajami I worship the primeval Lord Govinda, who is always seen by the devotees, whose eyes are anointed with the pulp of love. He is seen in his eternal form of Shamsundar, situated within the heart of the devotee. At this stage, Lord Krishna never disappears from the sight of the devotee, nor does the devotee ever lose sight of the Lord. In the case of a yogi who sees the Lord as Paramatma within the heart, the same applies. 
Such a yogi turns into a pure devotee and cannot bear to live for a moment without seeing the Lord within himself. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manovi Stam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Sarasati Deve Gaudavani Bacharine Nirvishesha Shunya Vari Pastyatyare Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. One who sees me everywhere and everything in me, I am never lost, nor is ever he is ever lost to me. So there's only two, two, two aspects of reality. One is Krishna, and the other one is Krishna's energy. Mm -hmm. Everything in existence, both created and and unmanifested, is within those two categories. Krishna means Krishna and his internal energy and everything else is his external energy. Sometimes we say there's a marginal energy which is the living entities but the living entity is uh, part of the internal energy and the marginal energy is the, uh, is the material energy. So marginal means in between. So for the sake of understanding the living entity in the material world, he's called marginal. It means he sits on a fence. He can fall one side or the other side. He can go towards the spiritual. He can go towards the material. But ultimately, uh, it's all. it says that there is only Krishna and Krishna's energy. Parasya Shakta Vidhaya Suyate Svabhavaki Gyana Palakriya Cha. When Krishna wants something to happen, he simply directs his either internal energy or his external energy. His energy work fully under his control. Balakriya. Kriya means uh, activities. Uh, and they have complete power to fulfill the desire of the Lord. He manifests the energy and he directs the energy also. He's within everything, but he remains outside everything. As it mentions in the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, uh, he is, I'll read that verse. It's a really nice verse from the ninth chapter. By me in my unmanifested form, the entire universe is pre All beings are in me, but I am not in them. So he is in everything, but at the same time he remains outside of everything. And for the Mayavadis, he speaks this verse, so people will not think that he is also, he is what we say, Worshipped through the material energy. So he remains unmanifested, but he manifests himself in the hearts of all the living entities, and he is also the all pervading Brahman spirit, which makes up the entire creation. Everything moves by the power of Brahman. Brahman is one. Brahman cannot be divided into two. And therefore, Brahman is the, what we say, the first step in God realization that this whole material energy is pervaded by the Brahman energy. Eka dvitiya nishti, what is eka dvitiya, eka nasti dvitiya. 
he is one and he remains undivided, but he manifests his different energies for the sake of creation and for the sake of mostly for activities, for creation and for knowledge. Three main energies, Icha Shakti, Kriya Shakti and Jnana Shakti. Icha Shakti is the, the uh, power of, uh, Kriya Shakti is the power of activity and Jnana Shakti is the power of knowledge. Uh, Icha Shakti is the power of creation. Like that, so he he manifests his energies in different ways, but him and his energies are not different. The the Maya bodies and others like to divide the energy from the source of the energy. But you cannot do that. It's just like when you block the rays of the sun by a cloud. There, in other words, the rays are no longer visible, but they're still there. In the same way, the Lord and his energies are inseparable, but for the sake of activity and manifestations, they appear to be separate. So just like it says everything is the energy of the Lord, but the Lord is not personally within his energy, but he's there in his impersonal form, in the form of the Brahman effulgence. So for the sake of understanding everything is Krishna and everything is not Krishna in the material world. But ultimately, from the highest principle, there's nothing outside of Krishna. Material simply means cut off. In the one sense, there is no such thing as material because although this is Krishna's energy, Krishna cannot create anything material. Material means you take something that is, that is created by the Lord and you use it for what we say selfish interest, that becomes material. So when the same energy is used in for Krishna's service, it, it, it attains, it retains its spiritual nature. But just like they say matter can never be created or destroyed, the forms of matter can be destroyed or changed but the elements that make up the forms are eternal. Bhumir hankar Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego are the manifested material energies. And these combination of these eight elements make up everything material. There's nothing outside of these eight elements. So. And so what we, when you see the different forms of this world, they are a combination of some or many of these same elements. If they're a living being, then they're a combination of all of the eight elements. If they're a stana, stana means, well, jada, not stana, I'm sorry. Stana means immovable living entities, but jada means dead. That means once the matter is uh, cut off from its source, just like a tree, when you take a tree, the, the bark is actually part of the living being's body. But then if you take, cut the tree down, then the, the wood that you take is no longer alive, it's dead. It's simply matter or dead matter. And then you use it in different ways. So that is, that means there's no life there. So, but everything is connected to life and everything moves by the force of life. Nothing can move without life itself and life is ultimately coming from Krishna through his various energies. So a devotee knows, as Prabhupada mentions in the first person, um, first sentence, he's, he says, a person of Krishna consciousness sees Lord Krishna everywhere and he sees everything in Krishna. So what does that mean? And then Prabhupada goes on, such a person may appear to see all separate manifestations of the material energy, but in each and every instance he is conscious of Krishna. So what does he mean that this is Krishna's energy? So that's what it means, that this is this is an energy, and therefore he manifests that energy as the material world. 
So nothing belongs to anyone except Krishna. Krishna is the supreme and sole proprietor of all existence. And so a devotee knows that everything in this world is Krishna's energy. And therefore, if I can use whatever is here in the service of the Lord, then that activity purifies the consciousness of the activator, of the person performing the activity. And uh, it reconnects that material element energy to its source in the form of devotional service. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada used an example sometimes, one time, or many times actually maybe, he had a pair of glasses. And so he held up his glasses and he said to the assembled devotees, when you see these glasses, what do you think? And of course, the answer was, Prabhupada, we see them as your glasses. They belong to you. Prabhupada said, yes, this is how you should see everything in this world belonging to Krishna. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one will not neglect or abuse or misuse anything because he under understands it belongs to the Supreme Proprietor. That's why a devotee is always conscious of how he treats the material energy also because he knows it's actually Krishna's energy and should be treated in a proper way. And of course, the best way is to use it in the service of the Lord. So this is a devotee. He understands not there's nothing outside of Krishna and his energies and him are non different, but they're different they're different in the sense of activity like that. You can't worship the energy, but you worship Krishna by using his energy. But Krishna's energy are non different. The example is given that in India, if you want to worship the Ganges, the Ganges you go to the Ganges and you scoop out a handful of water and you offer prayers to the Ganges by pouring the Ganges water back into the Ganges. So what does the Ganges water have to do? What does the Ganges have to do with the water? It's her water anyway. You just took it and now you're putting it back. So everything in this material world belongs to Krishna. We're just using it. And when we offer it back, with prayer or devotional activity, then that connects the devotee to Krishna in devotional service and purifies one's consciousness. And when we do that with everything we do, then that is pure Krishna consciousness. To see everything in relationship to Krishna and everything, and to, you, and to be in the mood of serving everything in terms of connecting it back with Krishna. So you'll see a, a devotee will uh, not misuse or abuse or waste anything. When Prabhupada would sometimes be on a morning walk, he would see someone's house, the faucet would be dripping from the outside. He would tell a devotee, go over there and turn the faucet off. When he would see people using lawn sprinklers to water their lawn, he would say, oh, what a waste of water. Uh, when Prabhupada would see the lights left on unnecessarily, he would say this is a waste of Krishna's energy. And there are many incidences where he pointed these things out. Uh, if he saw like in India, people have fans in their rooms. And so they were sometimes they leave the room and leave the fan on. But Prabhupada would find out he would be he would be concerned and tell him to shut it off. So when you leave the room. So Prabhupada was very conscious that everything is the energy of Krishna and should never be misused or wasted like that. Just like when we cook prasadam, we should make sure that if we have extra, it gets distributed somehow and not just thrown away. Um, it's now, of course, nowadays it's a little hard because of the situation to distribute prasadam. But then we have the living entities outside, and we can make prasadam available to the 
to lower living entities like that. But try to cook in such a way that everything is used so there's no waste. This is very important. <laughs> okay, so devotee is very conscious that everything is the energy of Krishna and uses everything in the best possible way. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Gabriel? Gabriel has something. Thank you very much, Your Holiness. I was just wondering um, how, how good are these uh, artificial energies for us? Um, I've, I've, as soon as I quit smoking and as I joined the Krishna consciousness, I, I gave up my, my cell phone and I gave up using internet too much and I'm trying to avoid all of these energies because sometimes when I'm meditating too much I feel like there is something more than just my own mind <laughs> and uh, I understand that radio waves are everywhere how much uh, is that also okay that that it is there and it is it meant to be there or is it something what it's not so meant from Krishna to be used from us for him or is it simply, well, or is it from Krishna? Prabhupada said we are not against technology. We're, we're, the, we're, we're against the misuse of technology. He said we don't create any of the technology, nor is it our business to do that. But if they create something, we can use it in Krishna's service. But again, there's Yukta Vairagya which is, means to use things in Krishna's service. But there's a misuse of that principle, too, where there's unnecessary use of these things that are created. And therefore, one has to be very conscious of that. They do pollute the environment, too, especially these radio waves all over the earth <laughs> and uh, you know all kinds of other energies that are pervading the earth's atmosphere. Uh, there was one doctor who has just recently been speaking, and he attributes the, this coronavirus and previous epidemics that's happened within the last hundred years to these radio and uh, all these different energies that we've created through technology that are disturbing the Earth's atmosphere. So we may have a cell phone, but should be used just as absolutely necessary. Computer in the same way. We can get overly engrossed in these technological things and forget about spending time with devotees, forget about spending time with Prabhupada's books, uh, forget about doing other services that that we could be doing. So there is a little bit of a misuse even our, within our society for these technological gadgets. Therefore, I try to be very careful in these areas and uh, use it just to the bare minimum. And if you're chanting Japa, don't answer your phone. <laughs> I never do when I'm doing my japa. If something comes in, I'll do it. I'll take it later. But japa period for me is sacred, and I think that should be followed. It's like there was one saying: when I chant, I chant. That means I don't do anything else. <laughs> when I chant, I chant. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I remember it when I read Chaitanya Charitamrita that uh, this verse about seeing Krishna everywhere. Um, I, I also understand that we should see that matter 
belongs to Krishna. It's Krishna's energy. But uh, in the verse specifically, it was uh, it said that pure devotee sees the form of Krishna everywhere. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in which way pure devotee or, or Uttamadikari devotee sees Krishna's form in everything? He actually sees, he sees the object, but he sees Krishna within the object. In other words, he'll see a tree, and he'll see, but he'll also see Krishna within the tree. He'll see both. He'll see the manif the material manifestation and Krishna within it. That's what that verse is saying. <laughs> well, that's pure Krishna consciousness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Krishna is, yeah. Well, that he's 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 Bhagavan realized, fully Bhagavan realized. That's purified consciousness, because in our natural state of consciousness, there is no matter. There's nothing but Krishna. Matter is simply a cloud, a covering over the spiritual energy. That's all. When that cloud gets removed by pure consciousness, we see. The cloud is no longer there. We see that same energy that you were seeing before in the terms of the forms of the energy. Now you see Krishna within that, those forms. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, Pure Devotee will see both the form and Krishna simultaneously. But he'll see more Krishna than the form. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, Yes, Matko. Um, Hare Krishna, my question is, uh, can one come to the point of, uh, I, I thought of this earlier, can one come to the point of seeing Krishna everywhere, um, viewing everything as Krishna's energy or everything belonging to Krishna uh, by always reminding themselves of this? Or is it just through sadhana and uh, devotional activities? Well, knowledge leads to realization. But realization comes by purification of the heart. So to have the fundamental principles of reality or truth helps one to function on this level in a Krishna conscious way. But it's not until the heart becomes fully purified and the consciousness becomes free from all material tinge that one actually sees Krishna. <laughs> so it's the process, but we also live according to the principles of the knowledge that governs the process. So both. <laughs> and by practicing the, the knowledge in terms of our day-to-day -day application, we start to develop the right consciousness. Mm -hmm. Anything from the outside? Okay. Any other? Yes, uh, Gabriel. Um, Your Holiness, by your opinion, can something like that exist that humans have created to help the matter itself when something is um, uh, doesn't have really cure for it, but they can give us a little bit longer life by connecting us to artificial energies is it is it something what is what we should surrender to and accept it as krishna's arrangement or is it just a theory set by people and we should i don't know if if we are able to not um, surrender to it and not to have to deal with it should we uh, avoid it you're talking about what's created by the human beings on this earth 
Yeah, but it's all created from Krishna's energies. Everything they work with is coming from the energies of the Lord. They're just putting it together in different forms, that's all. So it's artificial because it is being used in the wrong way. But the ingredients are all coming from the material energy. It's like electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the energy of the earth. And there's different energies. Krishna has 16 principal energies, 16 energies and three principal energies. Each is Shakti, Jnana Shakti, and, and Kriya Shakti are principal energies, but there's 16 energies, which he uses in different ways, both in them to manifest the, the internal activities of the spiritual world and to also manifest the different activities of the material world. These different energies of the Lord. So those who come up with something, apparently use the word artificial, or created. The living entities are the secondary creators. They take what's already been created and recreated into something else. Mm -hmm. That's all the gadgets and activity things we have, cars, computers, phones, various types of machines, um, you know, heaters, coolers. It's just taking Krishna's energy and combining it in different ways and coming up with these different, uh, what we say, creations like that. The idea is not to simply exploit the material energy to create something new in order to sell the product in order to get some pecuniary benefit. That's what's happening. People are living entities exploiting the earth simply to create some new object that they can market. And then they have to market the object by creating a whole realm of advertising in order to get people to buy something that they created, which generally people don't need. When it comes right down to it, we don't need much to live. We need very little to live. We need, but what do we need? Well, there was a statistic not long ago where 95% of the uh, products on the marketplace in the world are called, uh, what are they called? Um, not essential, not essentials. And 5% is essential. And so if you go back 150 years to around 1850 and you use those same categories, you'll find the numbers were opposite. There was 95% of the things that were available to people were essential and 5% were non-essential. So we've created a non-essential world just simply by exploiting the earth. And what is the reactions? Material energy throws out various types of sufferings to the material, to the living entities. And this one we have now, we could say it's also largely due to exploitation of the earth. Yeah. And Prabhupada writes that and pestilence actually comes by uh, the sinful activities of the living entities. So, yeah. So what do we need? We need food. We need water. Obviously, air is supplied already. We need maybe some place to live, so some building materials. Um, we need education, so maybe some books. And what else do we need? We need some health care, like that, some medicines. But it's all coming from nature anyway, all these things. Books are made out from trees. Medicines are coming from the herbs and the earth. <laughs> so, 
so we've just sophisticated the, the arrangements of the Lord to somehow make a very complex society so people can spend work hard, spend a lot of money, and then ultimately, you know, get products they don't even need. Just like food, you know, you know, just get a plot of land, cultivate the ground, and grow some food. And if the food, and if you want food that's not able to grow in your environment, you take extra of that you produce and you trade it with people who produce it in another environment. You have what is called the barter system, where you exchange labor and goods without any money, without any of this artificial currency that they use now called paper, call it money. It's artificial because if the government collapses or the government says it's no longer any good, and then you, you just throw it away. That's what happened in, a few years ago in India when the president recalled certain notes and reissued other notes. So people who had certain amounts of notes, people were telling, I was in India at the time, and people were burning, you know, money. They were just throwing it in a big pile and burning it because it was just paper. <laughs> so, you know, we live in a very artificial society. Wealth is really precious metals like that. Wealth is land. Land is wealth. Livestock is wealth. Precious metals is wealth. <clears throat> so yeah, this whole, what we say, industrial civilization has created a, a completely artificial lifestyle. And Prabhupada says, someday it will collapse because it's artificial. It can't last. And we're seeing how it's collapsing already in this present situation. <laughs> That's why the principle is simple living. That way you have time for what we say, spiritual life, you have time for family, you have time for friends, you have time, you're, you're free from anxiety this uh, very highly technological society has created so much anxiety, stress, diseases, various types of illnesses, simply because of the way we live. <laughs> so yeah, what God has given to us is being meant to use in the proper way, but we have a society that exploits these things, puts them together. I think what we, they were saying in the, in the United States of America, they have this thing called the patent office. The patent means that it ha any anything that you market has to be approved before it hits the marketplace by a particular agency. They call it the patent agency. So it's been shown that, and this was a few years ago, every Every week, 250 new items come to the patent office. People are just thinking about creating new things to sell so they can, you know, get more money. <laughs> they sell everything. They'll make anything. You know. Our, our world has become so complicated and so so complex just to just to do the basic things in life you know waste of time waste of energy waste of health mm -hmm. That's why Prabhupada said, you know, we should develop our farms and teach people how to live. <laughs> First, we have to be able to 
show by example, and then we can invite others to take part. And these farm communities, rural communities, are actually foundations for teaching the principles of simple living. You can still have nice things, but it doesn't mean you have to, you know, work like an ass simply to get your food and get all these other things that are not even necessary. <laughs> You just go into a store, and, and if you want to buy a particular item, you'll find that there's at least 10 brands of the same item. <laughs> it's like one of our senior devotees was giving a lecture. He said, I was doing some work on one house, so I had to buy some tile glue, glue for tiles. So I came to the uh, the hardware store and I was looking and I saw there was 19 different brands of tile glue. So I went to the cashier and I said, well, which one do you recommend? He said, basically, all the, they're all the same. <laughs> but everyone buys this one brand because on the cover there's this half-dressed lady. So in order to sell the product, they put these half-dressed ladies on the, on the covers of things. And it seems to be the, the product that everyone buys, you know. But the conclusion was all, the, all those items were practically the same. <laughs> As Prabhupada said, the Western diseases, whatever you do, change. Do something new. <laughs> she said, that's the disease of the West. Okay. Do we have any questions out there? Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.